Good morning. Happy fourth, almost. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> um, last week we left off uh, with the priesthood, and uh, today I want to talk about uh, the most correct book on earth, according to Joseph Smith. But b- before I do that, I want to go back and bring up one topic relating to the priesthood, and that is blacks in the priesthood. Um, A lot of modern Mormons today are not aware of the history of blacks in the Mormon church. Prior to 1978, there was a ban on blacks uh, being able to hold office of the priesthood. And as a matter of fact, the Book of Mormon in Alma 3.6, it says, And the skins of the Lamanites were dark, according to the mark which was set upon their fathers, which was a curse upon them because of their transgression and their rebellion against their brethren, who consisted of Nephi, Jacob, Joseph, and Samuel, who were just and holy men. So, according to Mormon doctrine, uh, those with black skin, uh, their skin is darkened because of a curse. <clears throat> and it was in 1978 that the then Mormon apostle, uh, Spencer Kimball, got a revelation that the curse was lifted. So um, even though the curse is lifted, uh, there's still a lot of racism within the Mormon church. They don't want to talk about it. They try to ignore it. And they certainly never bring it up to uh, people today coming into the Mormon church. Um, But there's overwhelming evidence as to uh, even today racism within the church. So another verse I wanted to read is 2 Nephi 5, 21-24. And this kind of gives you an idea of the background. And it says, And he had <clears throat> caused the cursing to come upon them. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him. Wherefore, they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people. The Lord did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. And thus saith the Lord, I will cause that they be loathsome, unto thy people, save that they shall repent of their inequities. And because of their cursing which was upon them, they did become an idle people, full of mischief, subtlety, and did seek in the wilderness for beasts of prey. So, according to the Book of Mormon, blacks are loathsome uh, and cursed, just simply because of, of the color of their skin. Brigham Young, who took over for Joseph Smith, even said this, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. Now that's Brigham Young, who, after the death of Joseph Smith, really advanced uh, the Mormon church. You've heard me mention Bruce McConkie, um, who wrote Doctrines and Covenants. And Bruce McConkie even said this, as a result of his rebellion, Cain was cursed, and to that the earth would not thereafter yield him in abundance as previously. In addition, he became the first mortal to be cursed as a son of perdition. The Lord placed on Cain a mark of dark skin, and he became the ancestor of the black race. McConkie goes on to say, the Negroes are not equal with any other races when the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned, particularly the priesthood and the temple blessings. It is the Lord's doing based on his eternal law of justice. But Those comments by McConkie were prior to 1978 and prior to 
the revelation that Spencer Kimball had. Here's what Bruce McConkie says <clears throat> after the revelation. Forget everything that I said or what President uh, Brigham Young said. Okay, so everything's changed now, so forget what he said before. <clears throat> um, has said, in the days past that it is contrary to the present revelation, we spoke with a limited understanding. It doesn't make a particle of difference what everybody said about the Negro <clears throat> matter before the first day of June of this year, 1978. It is a new day and a new arrangement, and the Lord has now given the revelation that sheds light into the world on this subject. As to any slivers of light or any particles of darkness of the past, we forget about them. How convenient. Just forget about everything we said before there was racism. Now everything has changed and we're welcoming the blacks into the priesthood. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Mormon apostle Mark E. Peterson. Now he was part of the Quorum of the Twelve from 1944 until his death in uh, 1984. And this is what an apostle and member of the Quorum of the Twelve said. We were generous with the Negro. We are willing that the Negro have all the highest kind of education. I would be willing to let every Negro drive a Cadillac if he could afford it. I would be willing that they have all the advantages that they can get out of life in the world, but let them enjoy these things among themselves. I think the Lord segregated the Negro, and who is man to change that segregation? Yeah. They well both. I mean, they they will allow blacks to administer, you know, in different parts of the world, like in Africa. But they also send <clears throat> the whites as long as they're in the priesthood, which the blacks are now able to be in the priesthood. <clears throat> then they can they can do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they and the blacks now are even allowed to take part in the endowment ceremony, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. But the interesting thing is that. Mark Peterson said that blacks in the afterlife will spend eternity in the celestial kingdom. Which one is the celestial? First, second, or third? It's the third. It's the highest. As servants. So in 1978... <clears throat> excuse me, June of 1978, Spencer Campbell, uh, then the apostle prophet, received a revelation <clears throat> that God had lifted the curse. And therefore, <clears throat> the ban was lifted and the blacks could now become uh, a member of the priesthood. And here's the interesting thing. Yeah. Prophet is working on the revelation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the interesting thing is that in, in September of that year, 1978, September 30th to be exact, at the 148th General Conference of the Latter day Saints, there was a proposal to accept the revelation that came to Spencer Kimball, and it was voted upon and accepted. 
and, and you have to, you know, if your mind goes like mine does, you have to wonder, it's like, okay, Spencer Kimball is a revelator. He's an apostle. He received a revelation from God. But then the General Assembly has to vote on whether or not to accept it. I mean, am I the only one that's going, what? Okay. <clears throat> so keep in mind, the, supposedly the initial reasons for this curse on the black skin uh, was supported by Mormon doctrine, but then they're going to tell you that it was God who gave the curse. <clears throat> now, um, you've heard me mention Lynn Wilder. She, she was a former professor at BYU. And if you get a hold of the book, Unveiling Grace, it's an amazing book that she wrote as to why she left Mormonism and how she led up to it. But Lynn Wilder said this, when BYU finally adopted what most universities call a diversity statement, BYU coined the phrase enrichment statement to avoid upsetting church folk, especially large donors. Instead of viewing multiculturalism as real enrichment to education, many Mormons viewed it as a threat to their cherished values and culture. In addition, multiculturalism was considered an ideology of liberalism, anathema to Mormon country. So even though Lynn Wilder and her husband Michael were deeply involved in the church, and again, she was even a professor at BYU. They left LDS after comparing the Bible with the Book of Mormon. And her comments are pretty clear that even though the curse has been lifted, that there is still racism, as I mentioned, in the Mormon church. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, they also wrote another book called Seven Reasons Why We Left the Mormon Church. Another great book. Uh, you can get it in <clears throat> hard copy, or you can get it on Kindle. You know, if you're one of these that likes the the e-books. Um, but it's something that they don't they don't talk about. And I was hoping to talk about it last week when I was talking about the priesthood. But that's why I wanted to start with this, even though this isn't actually the topic. But I think it's important. Uh, and if you you know if you have Mormons knocking on your door and you bring this up, they may not even know about it. Because you're, you're talking about, you know, 19, 20 year old missionaries <clears throat> and, you know, they weren't even around in 1978. So they're going to go, what are you talking about? It's there, but it's there in the, <clears throat> in the Book of Mormon. Now, there has been, and we're going to get into this in a few minutes, but there have been a number of changes in the Book of Mormon. And if you can get a copy of the Book of Mormon prior to 1989, especially prior to 1964, you'll see some of the stuff in here that is no longer in the Book of Mormon because it's been replaced. <clears throat> the most correct book on earth has had a number of changes in it. And again, we're, we're going to get into that. So, you almost have to ask yourself, if, if, you, if you take yourself back to 1978, <clears throat> did this revelation come about because of a revelation by Spencer Kimball or because of the Civil Rights Movement? Because the Civil Rights Movement, starting back in the in the late 60s, carried on and was really growing momentum back in the mid and late 70s. So you, you kind of have to ask yourself, because otherwise, why at that particular time and why after all those years that all of a sudden the blacks are no longer cursed? <clears throat> oh. As a matter of fact, when I was going to Biola for my master's and I was taking a class in history of Mormonism, one of our assignments was we had to go out and interview uh, a Mormon. And so 
myself and my good friend Greg, because we had to go out in, in pairs, my good friend Greg, who's black, was black and still is black. Um, we interviewed this, uh, he's actually a Superior Court judge in Orange County, California, and lifetime Mormon. And I knew it was going to happen, and he brought it up. He looked at Greg and he said, you know, at one time, you weren't allowed to be in the priesthood, but that curse was lifted in 1978. And now you're, you, if you join the Mormon church, you could actually uh, be part of the priesthood. And I looked at Greg and I looked at the judge and I said, so what you're telling me is that in 1978, by Spencer Kimball, the curse was lifted. He goes, that's right. I said, why is Greg still black? <laughs> the judge looked at me and Greg looked at me and he goes, what? And I said, well, according to the Book of Mormon, the only reason my brother Greg is black is because there's been a curse on him. But if the curse is lifted, shouldn't the results of the curse also be lifted? Which means if, shouldn't he be white like you and me? And afterwards, we're walking down the parking lot to the car and Greg goes, I cannot believe you said that. <laughs> and I said, but think about it. If the only reason you're black is because of a curse and the curse no longer uh, is valid, Shouldn't you be white like me? And Greg, he just started laughing. He goes, it was funny, but I can't believe you said that. And I said, but think about that. Because if a curse is lifted, then the result of that curse should also be reversed, right? So, anyway, it just, I mean, it's something I, my mind went there and I just couldn't resist it. And do you think he had an answer for that? No. He didn't. So, <clears throat> According to the Book of Mormon, the reason the blacks were cursed, in addition to Cain, is that there is a spiritual war between two groups of angels. And the one group of angels who is kind of the precursor to blacks today uh, did not show valiancy in the war. And so because of their lack of valiancy, then they were cursed for being cowards and their skin was turned black. But all of that is in the past and now blacks can take part as being members of the priesthood can take part in the endowment ceremony. How many of you are familiar with the endowment ceremony? Okay, I figured you two would um, because of your relationships. Uh, it's <clears throat> the Mormon temple ceremonies. And by the way, only about 40% of people in the Mormon church even get to see the inside of the temple. And they go through what's called the endowment ceremony. And when they go through this endowment ceremony, they are empowered with certain powers and protections, usually... Um, temple marriages, mission trips, and it starts with temple workers washing the members' bodies, symbolizing the person's dedication to the Lord. Um, they receive their sacred undergarments. Is everyone familiar with the, the undergarments? Okay, so this is when they get the undergarments, and they will wear them for the rest of their lives to protect them against temptation and sin. They're also given a new name and they are not allowed to reveal that name to anybody. And the new name is for exaltation that will be used in the celestial level uh, of heaven. Then they're led through a curtain into a room representing the celestial kingdom. Uh, prior to entering Okay, and I'm not making this up. Prior to entering, they have to have a correct handshake. It's that secret handshake. And they have to show signs through holes in the veil of the curtain that leads to the inner. I said, I'm not making this up, okay? Um, 
And so <clears throat> the ceremony, except for the washing, can actually be performed for the dead. And what it does, it allows them to make progress in the afterworld. So if they didn't quite make it in this world, <clears throat> there's still a chance in the afterlife. So any questions on this stuff? Like I said, this isn't the main topic, but I did want to bring this up. So Book of Mormon, according to, yeah. Sometimes. I don't either. Well, they, they do because the Book of Mormon was written by, jo well, supposedly by Moroni, but translated by Joseph Smith. Um, And updated by everybody else, yeah. I've been studying this for 20 years and I don't understand it. Sure. <clears throat> and, and that's one of the big things is, is really their family value. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, my wife Alice, she had a dear friend who uh, years ago moved to Las Vegas and joined the Mormon church. And Alice asked her if she would read some of the articles that I had written, and this was 20 years ago. And her friend said, no, she, she wasn't interested. She said, the Mormon church saved her marriage. And Alice's response was, I don't doubt that it did, but that doesn't make it a true religion. But she was not interested in hearing anything other than what the Mormon church uh, reveals to them. As a matter of fact, if, if you have missionaries come to your house and if you have anything, you know, this stuff on Mormonism and ask them, you know, would you read this? You know what they're going to tell you? I'm not allowed. I can only read what is given to me by the Mormon church. See, that's called indoctrination. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the answer is because you're not part of the priesthood. And you're not part of that 40% that's allowed into the endowment ceremony. I think I mentioned before that when the, the huge temple in, uh, in Eagle opened, my daughter and her husband and his mom took a tour and my daughter when they got done came to me she says dad um, i kept asking this woman who was leading the tour all these questions and of course my daughter you know, growing up with an apologist as a dad knows a lot of this stuff you know that i teach and she said she couldn't answer any of my questions and, and i told her i said i'm not surprised because the majority of Mormons that attend the weekly service don't know this stuff. Remember I told you, I said, when you're done with this class, and we have I think three more after this, 
um, you're going to know more about Mormonism than the average Mormon. I mean, really, I'm not just saying that, but you, but you will. You, you're going to be more well-read and advised. Now, you're probably not going to remember all this stuff, uh, and certainly not the, the quotes that I read, but just know that they're there. And by the way, if you're interested, um, if you go to Amazon Kindle, you can download you know, the Book of Mormon, Doctrines, Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and have those at your hand that you can look stuff up. And the Mormon Church is really good about getting this stuff out to everybody. Uh, one, because they want you to join the church, but the good thing is that you've got free resources. And resources that you can use actually to, to help. When you get a couple of Mormons knocking on your door, all you're going to do is be able to plant the seed. And what I like to say is plant the seed enough to where you're going to be a pebble in their shoe that every time they walk, it's like, ow, okay, there's something bothering me. There's something bothering me. And here, Lynn Wilder, professor at BYU, their whole family left the Mormon church. So it's possible. But it's, it's difficult. You're not going to get someone to convert to Christianity on their mission trip. But again, you can certainly give them something to think about. And when I told you there were, we were in Los Angeles, there were, three, there were three weeks in a row where a couple Mormons uh, came to visit. Well, first week was two Mormons, second and third week, they brought a more advanced Mormon who was further into his missionary trip. And the third week, as they were leaving, I said, can I tell you how to become a better Mormon missionary? They looked at me and go, okay. I said, you know, I'm not the smartest guy around, but I'm passionate about what I believe. So when you come across a Christian who's even more knowledgeable than I am, here's what you do. As much as you read the Bible, I mean, as much as you read the Book of Mormon, read and know the Bible as well as you know the Book of Mormon. And that way, when some Christian asks you about the Bible, you'll have the answer to it. And they're going, that sounds good. So I, they thought it was kind of strange. I was going to tell them, how to become better missionaries. Read the Bible. Know it like the Book of Mormon. So, I mean, that's, that's the best I could do. So, Joseph Smith, who said, <clears throat> Book of Mormon is the most correct book on earth. And he, he said this, he said, these plates have been revealed by the, the power of God, and they have been translated by the power of God. The translation of them, which you have seen, is correct, and I command you bear record of what you see and hear, okay? So the Mormon narrative um, seems like there's no room for error, no room for correction, no room for changes. H has there been any changes in the Book of Mormon since 1830? Yeah, about 4,000. Actually, a little over 4,000 changes since 1830. Um, now, in the Ensign, which is the official LDS magazine, they claim that all these changes are either typographical errors, misspellings, grammar, and so forth. But here comes the, the Mormon dilemma. David Wimmer, who was one of the three witnesses, supposedly, to the Book of Mormon, said, uh, Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. And I want you to imagine this, okay, as I read this. He would put the seer stone into a hat, put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude light. And in the darkness, spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, 
and under it was an interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery. Remember him? He was one with Joseph Smith when they were endowed with the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood. So he would read off uh, into English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe, and when it was written down and repeated back to Joseph Smith to see if it was correct, then it would disappear and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, not by any power of man. Sounds pretty clear, right? Now, Joseph Fielding Smith, who is the sixth Mormon president, said, Joseph did not render the writing on the gold plates into English language in his own style of, of language. And here it is. Every word and every letter was given to him. The Lord caused each word spelled as it is in the book to appear with stones. And when Joseph had uttered the sentence or word before him, the scribe had written it properly, the sentence would disappear and another would appear. And if there was a word wrongly written or even a letter incorrect, the stones would remain and when corrected, the sentence would disappear as usual. So, ask the Mormon, how do you explain the thousands of changes in the Book of Mormon when testimonies claiming that a seer stone was used to interpret specific words and letters? Now, <clears throat> Steve Benson, who is actually the grandson of Ezra Taft Benson, uh, former president, uh, he wrote an art. Uh, newspaper article, and he said this, troubling to us was the philosophical unwillingness of the Mormon church to deal forthrightly with its doctrine and history. Our personal study revealed that church canon, history, and scripture had surreptitiously altered, skewed, rewritten, contradicted, and deleted. And this was in the uh, Arizona Republic, uh, May 22, 1994. So they're claiming that all these corrections were simply uh, grammatical errors, uh, misspellings, and so forth. But let me give you just a few, and I've got a ton of them, I'm not going to read them all, but let me give you a few examples. In 1 Nephi 11:18. The 1830 version of the Book of Mormon says, And he said unto me, Behold, the virgin which thou seest is the mother of God, and after the manner of the flesh. But then the 1981 edition of the Book of Mormon says, And he said unto me, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. Does that change doctrine, or is that just... A scribal error. Because in 1 Nephi 11.32 says, And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, that he was taken by the people, yea, the everlasting God was judged of the world. And in the 1981 edition says, And I looked and beheld the Lamb of God, that he was taken by people, yea, the Son of of the everlasting God was judged of the world. In Mosiah 21:28, which was actually changed in 1964, the original version in 1830 said, King Benjamin had a gift from God whereby he had in, to interpret such engravings. But then the updated says, King Mosiah had a gift from God whereby he, ch he could interpret such engravings. So, two different, totally different names. Totally different people. <clears throat> you know, and, and it goes on and on. And like I said, I mean, there's, I don't know how many, uh, there's, uh, there's a number of 
verses where if you look at them, if you can get yourself copies, and, and they're out there. There's copies of the uh, earlier versions of the Book of Mormon, and you can compare them with what they have today. Uh, when we lived in Los Angeles, what I did is I went down town Los Angeles, went to the Deseret Bookstore, and they had all these used books, and I picked up all kinds of neat stuff for reference. Um, I picked up, it's called the Quad, and it's about that thick, and it's King James Version of the Bible, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, and Doctrines and Covenants. And I picked it up for a couple bucks. And then I picked up, it was called the Mormon Pal. And that's what missionaries use as a guideline when they go out on their mission trips. So I read that, and when they came to my door, and we had the conversations, and they started asking questions out of this pal, I had already read it. So if you get a chance, uh, you can pick up, you know, just for a couple bucks here and there, some of this old stuff that will really give you firsthand knowledge to help you when they, you know, if they knock on your door. So the point of all this is that um, point out to them that these are not simply grammatical errors that have nothing to do with doctrine. But these are significant changes. I mean, God versus the Son of God. Um, Benjamin versus uh, Mosiah. So don't let them avoid the implications of the changes that have taken place in the Book of Mormon through the years. Uh, make them live up to it. So <clears throat> I also want to do is uh, look at some correction, uh, contradictions between the Book of Mormon and the Bible. And it reminds me of a verse we're all familiar with, which is 2 Timothy 3, 7, which is uh, ever learning, never being able to come to the knowledge of truth. That's kind of the Mormons. They, they're always learning, they're always studying, but they just aren't able to come to the knowledge of truth. So, for example, are we saved by grace or are we saved by works? I think we all know the answer to that. Um, the primary verse in the Bible is, is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? For by grace we have been saved through faith, right? Not of ourselves, it's not a, it is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. That's according to our Bible. But what does the Book of Mormon say? Second Nephi 25, 23 says, For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren, to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So think about that for a minute. Mormons say they're saved by grace, but that's after they've done everything that they can do that's humanly possible. Well, if that's true, and they're saved by grace after everything, would there be a need for a savior? Um, where was Jesus born? I think probably everybody in here knows where Jesus was born, right? Because in Matthew 2, 1 it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. But then in the Book of Mormon, in Alma 7.10, it says, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. So, the Bible says Jesus was born in Bethlehem, According to the Mormons, he was born in Jerusalem. Now, sometimes the, the Mormons will actually say, well, but Jerusalem is an area. It's not a city, it's, it's an area. Uh, they're kind of suburbs of each other. The problem with that is the Book of Mormon says that Jerusalem is a city. 
Because if you go down to 1 Nephi 1, verse 4, it says, For it came to pass in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, my father Lehi, having dwelt at Jerusalem in all his days, and in the same year there came many prophets prophesying unto the people that they repent, or the great city of Jerusalem must be destroyed. Oops. Um, let me bring up another one. When Jesus died on the cross, how long did the darkness last? From the sixth to the ninth hour, right? How long was that? Three hours. Luke twenty three forty four says, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Six, seven, eight, nine. But in Helaman fourteen twenty. Book of Mormon says, But behold, as I said unto you concerning another sign, a sign of his death, behold, in that day that he shall suffer death, the sun shall be darkened and refuse to give light unto you, and also the moon and the stars. There shall be no light upon the face of this land, even from the time that he shall suffer death for the space of three days to the time that he shall rise again from the dead. And there's more and more and more verses. Um, I want to talk about plagiarism in the Book of Mormon. Uh, interesting thing is there's some 27,000 words taken directly from the King James Version of the Bible that wound up in the Book of Mormon. But how can that be? Because according to Mormons, the, the Book of Mormon was written somewhere between 600 B.C. and 421 A.D. So if that's the case, then how did some 27,000 words wind up in the 1611 King James Version of the Bible? You know, for example... Um, I'll read a few and then we're done. Um, Matthew 10.22 Endureth to the end and shall be saved. 1 Nephi 13.37 Endure unto the end and shall be saved. Uh, Revelation 7.14 Made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 1 Nephi 12.11 Made white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 20, verse 2, that old serpent, which is the devil, and in 2 Nephi 2.18, that old serpent, who is the devil. And again, it goes on and on and on, and many of them exactly the same wording as the King James Version of the Bible. So, the most correct book on earth has been changed over 4,000 times. There's over 27,000 words taken directly from the King James Version of the Bible. So, and if you remember the way it was written, is that if one letter, not just one word, but if one word and one letter was wrong, it wouldn't disappear until... Joseph Smith related to Oliver Cowdery, and it was written correctly and then disappeared. And again, this is stuff that they don't know. The average Mormon does not know this stuff. So hopefully what we'll do is by the end of you know, the eight weeks, you'll be confident enough that when you hear that knock on the door, invite them in. And just plant that seed, you know, put that pebble in their shoe, okay? Um, next week <clears throat> is uh, going to be the Maranatha Singers, so we won't have the class. And the following week, I'm going to uh, show another video called uh, The Missing Book of uh, Abraham, which absolutely destroys Mormonism.
Okay? And then we'll have two classes after that.